what's left of a forest in the Siletz watershed. It's really much like a museum exhibit. You know, it's a look back into the past. This is uh, 51 acres of original forest. So we're talking about a tiny uh, postage stamp here. And we're right now we're in like the holy water, the headwaters where the, the fish spawn, or a lot of the fish spawn. I have a lot of friends, you know, who've moved to Oregon in the last 10 years, and they bring with them notions of Oregon forests. And this is what it looks like. They imagine lots of moss, huge trees, big ferns, salmonberry, uh, and then they go drive around and they don't see that anywhere. I mean, in fact, you know, we had to drive hours to get here today to this 51 acres of remaining original forest. This is all that remains. So here we are in the uh, industrial cut zone. You can see how extensive these cuts are and also just how young they all are. Almost the entirety of the basin has been cut in the last 10 years. So the companies you know, that own these lands and are also managing themselves with the help of the Oregon Board of Forestry, they are gambling on the best interests of all the people who live in this watershed and love this watershed. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> For millennia, salmon thrived in the cool waters provided by temperate rainforests and small spring-fed streams. These tributaries were the capillaries that formed the river. Fall marked the largest runs of salmon that brought in marine nutrients which fertilized and fueled a complex web of life. Trees that fell in the forest gave life to new trees, just as the salmon that died gave life to new salmon. There was a symbiotic relationship with life and death in the forest. This was nature's way of engineering an ecosystem. During the freshets of winter, the forests would anchor the slopes and absorb the heavy rains. But when they took the trees, the land became unstable. You know, we're already losing the fertility and the fecundity of the soil because you cut on a steep slope it rains and you lose that topsoil. These places where the soil has pulled free, in many respects, this is the most long term of the damage that we see in these clear cuts. These soils take tens of thousands of years to build and when they're gone, they're gone. And what holds these soils to the hillsides are these tree roots. If you have an entire watershed that's clear cut in a decade or two or even three, you'll have a major portion of that landscape that is in a state of a reduced root strength for a fairly long period of time. And if you happen to get that 50 or 100 year storm during that period, you'll have a lot of the land being essentially vulnerable to sliding at a higher rate than it would have without that kind of practice. Thousands of miles of logging roads were carved out of the landscape, triggering landslides and transporting sediment to the rivers below which created torrents of mud that suffocated salmon eggs and delivered dirty drinking water to communities downstream. Essentially, when we have these big clear cuts and these roads, we're increasing the frequency of, our, of landslides in the basin uh, from what they would be naturally. 
And as a result, we're getting just massive amounts of fine sediment ending up in the river. During summertime droughts, the large trees captured fog off the Pacific Ocean and would convert the moisture to water, which contributed up to a quarter of a watershed's flow. Today, there are very few areas with large trees left to collect the fog. The feeder streams are logged over, and only a small buffer of trees is left for shade along the main river itself. Water here bakes in the sun all summer. That higher temperature just runs downstream too into the main river, bumping the water temperatures there. Those headwater streams, those sort of steep, small, non-fish-bearing streams, are a key link in the, the chain of processes that create and maintain and can alter and destroy salmon habitat. Salmon are the ultimate indicator species for ecosystem function and health. And with the Oregon Coast Coho listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, the fish are telling us we need better stream protections. The forests of the Oregon coast were some of the largest carbon banking systems on Earth, sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere. We live in an area in western Oregon where the density of carbon, the amount of carbon per acre stored by an ecosystem is higher than almost any other place in, in, in the world. When we cut that down, then, we emit more carbon dioxide per acre than any other place in the world. The forests were rich in biodiversity, which acted as a biosecurity holding the ecosystem together. The diversity has been simplified with the application of herbicides, pesticides, artificial fertilizers, and rodenticides that create a vast monoculture of Douglas fir saplings across millions of acres of Oregon's landscape. This is how humans have engineered an ecosystem, and it's called a working forest. Certainly, if an herbicide is effective at killing streamside vegetation, it's certainly effective at killing aquatic vegetation that jump starts the food web in our freshwater ecosystems. These herbicides that they're using are very harmful to aquatic ecosystems. Salmon actually are highly sensitive to any kind of uh, toxins. One of the chemicals that they use um, is atrazine quite a bit and that's actually banned in the European Union. It um, actually turns male frogs female. The federal government banned spraying chemicals such as atrazine on public forest lands in the 1980s. Spraying continues on private lands, and there is little regulation, information, and enforcement on what they are spraying, when they are spraying, or whom they are spraying. There's about a 12 mile an hour wind uh, blowing it right at me. Look at the drift on this right here. Holy moly. It's drifting hardcore, even though it's on. Oregon can do better for its fish, wildlife, clean air and water. But it all starts with managing forests based on science and reforming the Oregon Forest Practices Act. Uh, and so when people say Oregon's forests are healthy, the forests on public land are healthy. The forests on Oregon's private land in places like this, this is not healthy. At what length do we allow actions on private land to affect our public comments?